Well, good afternoon and welcome to this week's uh, edition of the Ag Market Situation Outlook uh, presented by NDSU Extension. Uh, once again, we'll have a series of presentations about the current uh, uh, situation, egg markets and otherwise, and in some respects is impacted by COVID. Um, with that, we'll hand it over to Brian Farman. All right. Thanks, Dave. <clears throat> um, today, I'm going to be a little bit uh, all over the place, it may seem, but I, I, if you'll bear with me, I'll kind of try to tie her all together. But uh, talking about some of the macro stuff again, and then I'm going to dig into some North Dakota um, <clears throat> farm management data. So one of the things that's going on right now uh, that folks are worried about is a second flare-up of, of uh, COVID or another, another spike in, in taxing uh, hospital beds as states begin to reopen and uh, more and more businesses getting are, are opening and, and, and folks going back to work. So my first slide shows the number of tests per thousand people. And you can see back in March, we had basically zero. And now uh, we're conducting you know, thousands and thousands of tests. And as you can imagine, the more testing you do on this, the more uh, infected folks that you're going to turn up. I mean, that just makes sense. And they're doing a lot more testing of people who maybe never had symptoms or didn't show any symptoms who, who test positive. So really the number of positive tests in and of itself isn't the issue or isn't what folks are so worried about. But what my next slide shows is the uh, number of positive tests per test conducted. And you can see that that's starting to uh, increase. Okay, so that's, that trend had been going down, down, down. And, 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 and when you think about it logically, it's pretty simple, right? Most folks back when we went back when this all started, uh, most folks who went to the hospital were very sick. Uh, you had to meet a certain criteria of symptoms to get tested because tests were expensive. They took several days. Uh, it was pretty cumbersome. So you really had to meet a lot of these benchmarks in order for somebody to conduct a test on you. Well, as we did more and more testing on folks who maybe didn't have all the symptoms or any symptoms at all, you see the positive rate went way down. So we're still doing more tests. We're still testing more, but then you see this the positive rate actually increasing there toward the right. And that is causing, if you've looked at the market today, why the stock market is so far down and other states where these big hot spots and flare ups are occurring uh, are are slowing their reopen and maybe even discussing some further restrictions. And this is what we were talking about uh, months ago when we, when we discussed reopening is how were we going to react if and when the infection rate started increasing, not the number infected, but the infection rate. And that's what we're seeing. And, and we'll be watching very closely on how this transpires going forward. And the, you know, epidemiologist type experts and stuff are really worried about, you know, what happens during uh, flu season, October, when if COVID is occupying a bunch of hospital beds, what's going to happen when people start getting sick with our seasonal viruses that, that tend to happen. So that's what's, that's what's on everyone's mind. That's what we're watching for. And uh, it'll, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how this all transpires and, and, and affects the economy in general. But back to the unemployment stuff, uh, as I've been saying every single week, pretty much uh, new, initial jobless claims has pretty much flattened out, actually. It's, it's a, just over a million folks per week are filing uh, new unemployment claims. We, we've seen that for the last several weeks in a row, and it seems to be slowing, but it's still extremely high. And if you look at the weekly continuous jobless claims, which is uh, on my next slide there, uh, it's flattened out as well. So some, a lot of folks are going back to work, but we have a lot of people who are being laid off. Some of these companies, there's a delayed impact on these businesses that thought maybe they were going to be able to make it through to the other side and didn't. So you're get, still getting a lot of layoffs and, and terminations. Uh, but some folks are continuing to go back to work. But this is still an extremely high number you know, 18, 19 million people out of work as opposed to just a couple of million before this all started. So it's still an extremely high number, but so far it's, it's been trending down a little bit as states reopen. But again, going back to that reinfection or not reinfection, but a, a number of uh, infected per test going up, that may impact this quite a bit. And <clears throat> how, it, how it all happens, it's going to depend on the actions that the states take. So I'm going to shift gears here next and talk some about uh, some of our farm business management data. And one of the things that as we look at 2019, which is at the far right hand side of the chart, um, 
it was basically the second worst year in the last 10, uh, with 2015 being the only year worse than 2019 for the most part. It was a pretty tough year. You can look there. Average, the average of all farm net farm income was pretty low, and that's despite a very large government program payment in the form of MFP in 2019, which is included in the net farm income. So in 2015, there wasn't that. To, to help out, uh, most of the program payments were from uh, uh, crop programs like ARC and PLC. Whereas in 2019, we had this massive MFP payment and yet still it was pretty pretty tough year. 2018, you'll recall, yes, we had an MFP, but net farm incomes were higher. The MFP was lower, but commodity prices for the first six month the months of the year for the most part in 2018 were, were quite a bit better. So my next chart, uh, chart just shows some uh, uh, profitability measures. And again, looking at 2019, the rate of return on equity, extremely low, uh, state average, almost zero. Again, not quite as bad as 2015, which was negative. And then the rate of return on assets, very low in, in 2019, as opposed to you look at the first part of the decade, rate of return on assets and equity up in the double digits, even 25% in 2012, which was a really banner year for North Dakota. Uh, but 2019, pretty tough year and, and certainly worse than 2018. So just how important have government payments been? And, and the tables I show next are, are a big part of that. And if you look, the left column uh, shows uh, gross, go, gross cash income, crop government payments, it'd be like your ARC and PLC, uh, uh, CRP, and then other, other government payments, MFP and disaster type payments. So in 2018, the state average was $60,200 per farm with a net farm income of 116,000. So government payments were about 50% of, north of 50% of uh, net farm incomes in North Dakota in 2018. If we'd look at 2019 though, the next slide, it shows how big MFP went up to $68,000, uh, other, other payments in MFP, uh, $68,000, which is uh, a huge chunk, uh, and total government payments of $86,569 as a state. So in other words, government assistance, CRP type stuff, uh, was over 100% of net farm income for the state. So in other words, without that, state average would be underwater by almost $12,000 per farm. So that's just how impactful and how big and, and important these, these uh, disaster MFP and other payments have been for our state for the last couple of years. And even the high 20% in terms of net farm income, their total government payments was over 50% of their net, net income. So that's just, that's just a big number to put into perspective uh, uh, what's been going on with these market facilitation programs and then the, the, the CARES Act that was put forth and how, how big of an impact that's gonna wind up having when we have some of the uh, 2019 numbers or 2020 numbers, okay? So uh, my next slide, my next chart shows the projections from FAPRI and I apologize that it's a little bit fuzzy. I took it straight from uh, FAPRI and the projected 2020 net farm income or for, for the US is 90 billion and they're projecting 2021 to be around that 79 billion, almost $80 billion mark. So a big drop in 2021 from 2020. And the difference is direct government payments. That's that, that's that underlined uh, row there on the chart. 32.8 billion FAPRI is projecting in direct government payments for 2020 by far the largest of ever uh, and substantially bigger by almost 10, 10 uh, billion dollars compared to 2019. So it seems like the FAPRI is projecting additional re relief this year, and then a big decline in 2021 being lower, and that explains why they expect the big drop in, in net farm income. Uh, crops and livestock payments uh, income being a little bit higher in 2021, but again, you cut, go from 32.8 billion as a country down to 16.6 .6 in direct government payments, and that makes a huge impact on, on net farm income going forward. And that's kind of what they're, what they're saying there is that the government assistance next year will be much less, uh, much less than this year and uh, the previous couple of years so far. And one last note, one last chart I just wanted to quickly cover something interesting in the data is if you look at this chart, it shows uh, how much, the average farm has in share rent, cash rent, and owned land. And 2019 saw a big spike in cash rented ground. It went from about 1,462 acres per farm to 1,608. It had been trending up and owned land had been trending down 
for, for many years, but we see in 2019 a big uptick in, in cash rented ground. Some of that could be a function of the data, uh, who came into the program and who left. But for, a, for an increase that much on average, there had to be, it seems like a lot, of, a lot more folks are, are taking on additional land to farm uh, last year in, in the form of cash rented ground, which I thought was uh, pretty interesting. A slight uptick in owned land, not, not, not huge, but, but big enough, and uh, the cash rented ground increase. So when we start talking about when will cash rents go down, when will uh, uh, go down to reflect commodity prices as something that, that they don't right now, well, you look at this chart here and you see why they haven't. If, if cash rented ground continues to increase and people continue to be willing to pay, pay for it, farmers competing for it, well, there's really no incentive for, for it to drop. And so that's kind of where we stand right now. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn, turn it over to uh, Dr. Frey Olson. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this week, I'd like to provide a little bit of an update on some new information we're going to get from USDA coming next week. Uh, so on Tuesday uh, next week, June 10th, or excuse me, June 30th, excuse me, uh, USDA is going to release both the acreage report and the grain stocks report. And so this week I thought I'd give you a little bit of a preview of what is the market expecting out of those reports and kind of the impact it might have on the, the supply and demand balance sheets uh, as we move forward. So on my, on my first slide, I just want to give you a little bit of background on how are these reports compiled and, and then I'll talk a little bit about how the information is used. So the grain stocks report is, is conducted every three months. So it's a quarterly report. Um, they do it, USD does a survey of both farmers as well as what we call commercial operators. So they have both an on-farm stocks number as well as an off-farm stocks number. Um, the on-farm stocks is again, farmer owned, typically farmer owned. Um, it's, it's what is on the farm at, as of the date. We're gonna have the June one report released uh, next Tuesday. So. What, you, what happens, USDA surveys about 79,900 farmers and asks them how much grain do you have on inventory on your farm on that particular day. They also conduct a survey of the commercial operators or of, of commercial grain storage facilities that's called the, the off-farm stocks. And again, because uh, grain storage facilities have to be certified, they have to be uh, certified and bonded, um, we have a list of those. And so there's approximately 8,400 facilities across the US, each one of them is contacted and asked, all right, how much do you have on inventory as of June 1? So when we look at the, these inventory numbers, they, they're gonna be pretty accurate. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more detail how the market uses this, how USDA uses this information. The one, the report that will likely get the most uh, interest that will be of, of greatest concern to the marketplace is gonna be the acreage report. So acreage report is really updates that March 31 prospective plantings report. So if you remember back in March, USDA sent out surveys to farmers and said, what do you intend to plant this year? We know things can change depending upon weather conditions and, and relative prices, but what are your plans? What's your thinking right now today? Well, the acreage report um, is a follow-up survey to that, uh, where farmers are, are resurveyed and asked, well, what did you actually plant? And so again, this becomes our, our reference point for, for uh, calculating how much production or our expectation for total production, how many bushels produced are in the United States. So again, USDA surveys approximately 68,100 farms or farmers. Uh, they conduct it during the first two weeks of June. Now, by the time we get to first two first weeks of June, usually the crop is completely planted. Now, again, I've in previous sessions, I've talked a little bit about the prevent plant problems we're having here in North Dakota, and the fact that there are some farmers that were pretty dramatically behind in their planting progress. Um, so I, those, those, some of those acres may not be fully captured, but the way the question is asked is how many acres did you plant or intend to plant? Okay, so it hopefully will capture and be, be relatively accurate, even for North Dakota. But for the rest of the country, uh, uh, most of the rest of the country had finished their planting progress by the first couple weeks of June. So on my next slide, um, this is the estimates. So the, um, it, before these reports come out, uh, major news agencies like Reuters or Bloomberg do surveys of the major um, private forecasting firms and some of the larger market an analysis firms or analyst firms 
and say, what do you, what, what do you expect this number to be? What would your number be? And, and they, they survey those folks. They pro compile the results of that survey because this really gives us kind of an insight on what is the market thinking the numbers will, will look like. So for the June 1 stocks report on the very top row highlighted in black, the bolded black is the average of the 26 firms that reported to the survey, that answered the survey. Um, it's broken down by all wheat, corn, and soybeans. And really to, to think about this, we need to compare that number both to what is the range, the highest number versus the lowest number, kind of how, how wide or how variable is the estimates within the industry. But also what are our reference points, not only from last year, which is the June 1, 2019, that highlighted blue line, but also the, the, the previous quarter, which was the March 1, 2020 number. So again, there's two different ways of thinking about this. One is let's let's look back and say, what do we expect to see in today's report or the report next week relative to last year at this time period? And if you look at the blue line versus the, the bolded black line, you notice that in all cases for all, all major classes, wheat, corn, and soybeans, the expectation is our inventories will be lower. So it looks like we're starting to take some of these inventories down. Uh, at least that's the expectation. The other way of thinking about it, and this is typically the way not only USDA, but some of the private forecasting firms look at it, is we, we look at the green line going across, that highlighted green line, which is the March 1. So that was the, the survey results for the inventory on March 1. Let's compare that to the survey results on June 1, and we have that three month block of time. So if you subtract those two numbers, it gives us an idea or at least a reference point on how fast are we using up our inventories? How, how fast are we burning through our available stocks? Now for, for wheat and for uh, soybeans, those numbers uh, are really a way to kind of validate to make sure we're on the right track. Uh, because we have other other methods, other surveys that USDA does to try and, and cross-check the usage, both for exports and domestic use for, for wheat and soybeans. But for corn, it becomes a lot more challenging because one of our major uses for corn, as I've noted in, in some other previous uh, recordings or videos, is the, the livestock sector. It's, it goes into the feed sector. And trying to monitor the quantity of feed or the quantity of corn going into the livestock sector as feed is a really, really difficult task. We can follow and track exports because we get weekly updates there. We can get a pretty good estimate of how much is going into the ethanol industry based upon the ethanol production numbers and Dave Ripplinger has talked about that. We can kind of back calculate and find out how much corn is being consumed. But really that that feed number becomes the residual. So we'll, we'll look at that three month time differential, we'll subtract out what the exports are, subtract out what, what went into the ethanol industry, or at least an estimate, and whatever's remaining either was spoilage and wastage, which is kind of this residual piece, or it went into the livestock sector at some point. So again, given all the changes now that we've had in adjustments that we've had in, in livestock, and Tim Petrie has talked a lot about that, you know, this feed number gets to be a little bit softer. It gives you a little more fuzziness on how fast we're chewing up the, the, the corn crop. And so again, this survey, um, this, this grain stocks report is gonna be watched saying, well, are we on track to meet the, the yearly totals or not? The next slide, it does the same thing for the acreage number. Again, um, this is a survey of 20, in this case, 28 different firms responded. Uh, again, private forecasters or, or, or larger green uh, or uh, market analysis firms and say, what do you think the planted acreage will be? And so again, I wanna compare that top row, which is the average of the 28 firms. And you can see also when you look at the highest reported value and the lowest reported value for, for, for both corn and soybeans, that's a pretty wide range of estimates. So there's still quite a bit of uncertainty regarding how many acres of corn and soybeans actually got planted. Uh, for the wheat and the wheat complex, it's, it's not as, as um, uncertain, uh, mainly because all the winter wheat had already been seeded. We've, we've got a bit more information about winter wheat seedings and how many acres got planted. For spring wheat in Durham, there's still a little bit of uncertainty and you can see the ranges uh, uh, percentage-wise are a little bit wider again. But what the market's gonna be looking at is 
that that black row, which is again, this is what the trade, the average trade trader is thinking the USDA report will tell us, versus the blue row, which again was this the information that came from the survey on March 31. So uh, one more time on the acreage reporting, what USDA is doing is they're not trying to forecast planted acreage. What they're trying to do is survey farmers and, and, and compile that survey information and say, this is what farmers are telling us they did. So I wanna be really careful about distinguishing between a USDA forecast versus what farmers are actually saying. So if we look at those numbers, the, the, the average trade guess is that the, the corn plantings, the number of corn acres planted will drop about 1.8 uh, million acres. That'd be about a 1.2 million acre increase in soybeans and then some slight tweaks or slight adjustments for the, through the winter wheat, spring wheat in Durham. So right now, the markets, the futures market we're looking at has these numbers kind of built into it for expectations. So when the report comes out, the fact that it's, again, potentially will be lower for corn is not really the issue. The question is, everybody's expecting it to be lower, so how much lower will it be? How would these change in planted acreage, how would that impact our expectations for the bottom line? How much not only corn are we going to produce, soybeans we're going to produce this year, but then also what will that do to our, the potential ending stocks, the amount of inventories that we're going to have available? This is uh, the corn supply demand balance sheet. This is from the June uh, report, June 11th report. So this is the most recent uh, forecast for not only production, but also usage for corn for the 2020, 2021 marketing year. So that's the column in blue on the far right hand side. So that would, that's the crop that's just been planted. That's the crop that's growing in the field right now. The middle column, the 2019, 2020, um, we know most of those numbers. There's still some of the usage numbers we're not sure. The, the marketing year for corn ends on September 1. So our quarterly stocks report is going to help us refine the usage numbers that you see in the bottom half of these tables. The acreage report really has a big impact on the, on the top right-hand corner when we look at what is our estimate or forecast for production. So if we use that, that blue column on the far right-hand side as a reference point, that's, that's kind of the numbers that were currently being used, and we adjust those planted, num planted acreage numbers, uh, what does that do to our bottom line? What does that do to that ending stocks number of about 3.3 billion bushels? So on my next slide, I did the math on that. What I did was, oop, that's two slides. If you can back up one, please. There we go. So what I did was I looked at, I, I, all I've done is change the numbers in red. So I changed the planted acreage, which then translates into the harvested acreage. Now in the, in, for corn, that differential is primarily corn silage. So if we harvest about, this would imply we, we might harvest about 88 million acres of corn. If we use the trend line yield of 70, uh, 178 and a half bushels, it takes our total production down just a little bit. Um, so our total supplies, if you add up all of the beginning stocks and production and imports, will also drop a little bit. I didn't make any adjustments to the usage numbers. So again, in, in uh, July, when USDA revises their forecasts, they'll, they'll likely adjust some of the usage numbers as well. But if all we did was shift planted acreage, our ending stocks, our ending stocks for corn, at least not based on the forecast, would drop almost 300 million bushels. Now, 300 million bushels is, is a lot of corn, and it sounds like a really, really big number, but it's in the whole scheme of things, when you look at producing 15.7 billion bushels, even with the revised number, um, that's not a lot. It's, it's really kind of nibbling around the edges. So even if the acreage is dropped, we get trend line yields, that uh, 15.7 billion bushels as an estimate would still be a record large corn crop. Now, as we move through the summer, this is things I've talked about before, that acreage, est or the, excuse me, the yield estimate is, is the number that is, is going to have also a big, big impact on what our production numbers are. So once we get this report on Tuesday of next week, um, that'll kind of lock in those numbers and then we'll re market will really, really be focused on, on the yield number and making adjustments accordingly. So again, acreage adjustments, they're going to be likely will be down. 
but at the end of the day, it's not going to make a tremendous difference in our bottom line. Psychologically, it'll have an impact, but it's not really, I think, in my opinion, unless there's some real shock value, unless that drop is much more than we expected, I, I really don't see a major shift or adjustment in, in, in corn prices. Now, the next slide, I do the same kind of procedure with soybeans. So the blue column on the right-hand side is the June forecast coming out of USDA. Um, with the planted and harvest acreage uh, from essentially from that March uh, 31 planting pers perspective plantings report. So on the next slide, what I did was I, I did the exact same adjustment. So most of the um, market analysts are, are expecting an increase or kind of a shift out of corn and a slight increase in soybean acres. We go um, to from uh, we go to 84.7 million uh, acres planted. Again, we take out some for for failed acres for drowned out. We plug in the 49.8 bushel trend line yield, and we get about 4.1, almost 4.2 billion bushels of of soybeans produced. Now that would be the second largest crop in the U.S. The the largest one historically in the U.S. was actually 2018-19, which is on the far left hand side. So we're not, we're not over the top, but we're still very, very close to a record production, even at that level. So again, if you do the math, you subtract out what our forecast for expected use is, the bottom line number um, uh, for ending stocks increases by, uh, well, 58 million bushels or, or almost 60 million bushels. Again, it's, it's an increase. Um, it does have a psychological effect but it's not a dramatic increase. And again, when you compare our ending stocks from 2018 to 2019, and now into the forecast for 2020, it's still trending downwards. But again, recognizing 2018 was some very, very, very large uh, soybean carryover stocks. On my final slide, um, I do the same, you know, I, I would want to show you what would happen to wheat, but the challenge is with wheat, the Planted acreage numbers that was used in the June report are nearly identical to the forecast that was coming out of, of the pre-report industry estimates. So really there was no change. So the expectation right now is on Tuesday of next week that it will likely not be very turbulent times or, or provide a lot of new or dramatic information for the, the wheat market. So again, my last slide, I just wanna remind everybody um, on, on Tuesday, June uh, uh, 30, next week, Tuesday next week, June 30 at 11 o'clock central time, these reports are going to be released and again expect uh, some market volatility when those reports come out. So with that, I'll hand things over to Tim. Well, thank you very much, Frank, and good afternoon everybody. Tim Petra, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Tim, I'm going to talk a little bit about just uh, slaughter steers to begin with and maybe get more into the meat sector and more on tastes and preferences of consumers and things that have been going on there but showed you this slide last time and uh, you know the red line again is this year and for the last month fed cattle prices have been struggling and uh, on that red line there's a little blue attachment for this week I'm expecting them to go down again but we won't know Monday so I think we're going to drop below a hundred dollars again like we did back there in mid-April. And then you see the futures are those red squares and uh, you know, futures aren't optimistic at all, uh, you know, and that's for the things that Brian uh, got talked about at the beginning, the, you know, the problems with the economy and so on. Now we could do better than this on fed cattle, but we gotta see how the pandemic goes. And so that's the, you know, the demand part of it. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about on then the problems we're having on the supply side. Last week when I talked to you, I said there was a cattle on feed report coming out in the afternoon. It did come out last uh, Friday afternoon. I said, we are really looking forward to it to see uh, how many uh, kind of what a backlog of cattle we might have. And so this slide shows uh, the number of cattle on feed for over 120 days, almost a million head more than last year at this time. So a lot of heavy cattle out there. And, uh, you know, we don't, didn't get in the report, but there's some estimates that the cattle on feed over 150 days might be half of that number anyway. So maybe half of it. So got a, a lot of cattle kind of backlogged and, and waiting for the slaughter market and the 
market knows that and that's why those futures prices are as low as they are and why the cash price is going down is because the market is aware of that. So go to the next slide. Uh, we didn't get any help from the hog industry. The quarterly, the cattle and feed report comes out monthly, but the hogs and pigs report comes out quarterly. And so uh, that report did not help us out at all. We knew we had a lot of hogs around, but USDA was even above trade expectations. Frain talked about trade expectations on the grain side, and we have the same thing here for hogs and pigs. Uh, you see that for all hogs and pigs, the trade estimate was for about 3.7% more than last year. And the, the shaded line there was the range in estimates up to about 105. The report came in at 5.2, which was on top of the trade estimates. There is some good news into the future in, this, in the middle part there that we did kill a lot of sows and the industry is trying to, uh, to reduce a, a little bit because we've got a record number of hogs and record pork production and extremely low below break even prices. And so uh, breeding hogs uh, about 1.3% uh, less than last year, which again is good news, but it was on the high end of the estimates. And then we go down to the all the market hogs, 5.8% more in the total US above trade expectation. If we go to the next slide, then uh, kind of shows you where the hogs are. And uh, again, the backlog we have on the top there, there's a category for over 180 pounds. And again, this is as of June 1st. And so we're into, you know, uh, well into June now. And so these would have, uh, have been and been heavier than that and been ready for slaughter almost 13 percent uh, or uh, 1.67 million had a, a big heavyweight hogs all-time record high for that amount and then the red circles there uh, down in the bottom left you see the that uh, anything with a the pound symbol is record high and so uh, number of states with this would be total hogs, not just the heavier weight that a, a lot of hogs, uh, you know, Minnesota, Iowa is the big hog state, and threw in Kansas and some other states and so on. And on the way on the right hand side towards the bottom, a record number in, in the United States. So anyway, uh, really a lot of problems up here in our part of the country because, uh, you know, both Sioux Falls and we're, uh, uh, and Worthington, Minnesota were closed up here. And although South Dakota wasn't at a record level, they still had 11, almost 11% 11 more hogs than they had a year ago. And, you know, Minnesota up there nine and so on. So, you know, the story is uh, actually a lot of hogs, a record amount of hogs and more than the trade was even expecting. So the futures market for hogs did show that today. And, down uh, two to three dollars. Didn't quite spill over into the fed cattle as much and fed cattle and feeder cattle maybe down like 50 cents to a dollar or so. But anyway, still has an impact on cattle prices obviously because of the competing meat there. So go to my next slide. I'm gonna kind of switch gears here. Maybe this would be kind of a, Byron, uh, a Brian excuse me, talk a little bit more. Uh, you know, we've been discussing restaurants and, and restaurants opening and again, about half the meat that isn't exported goes into the restaurant trade. So the, you know, livestock industry is watching that close. So again, we go back to May when some of the restaurants first started to open up and this is just the, uh, the week compared to last year of the number of seated diners at restaurants that are open for business. And so we started off there at 40% and gradually coming up. And then by a couple, three weeks ago, we were up to about 60% capacity, which was good news means we're moving product to restaurants. And then we spiked way up a week before last to about 90% people are really anxious to get to restaurants and, and the seating capacity and so on was reduced in places from the, you know, 40% to 50 to whatever to in some restaurants allowing them back to uh, many. So, but then as Brian mentioned at the beginning, we had this uh, spike in the number in the rate that he talked about. And so then uh, last week, quite a few uh, 
more open seats. And so we got to watch this really closely for what Brian said, is that going to go up and, and then are people going to, you know, not be as willing to go to restaurants and so on. So go on to the next slide. Uh, here, I'm just gonna maybe kind of give a little history lesson. Again, talk more about tastes and preferences of consumers that really have changed since the pandemic and maybe look, take a look more back at the history lesson. Starting off here with pork belly prices, a real interesting one for me to talk about. Uh, pork bellies are the wholesale cut where we get bacon. And so uh, talk about that. When you look at that red line up there on top, that's just the normal seasonal price pattern for pork bellies that goes along with bacon. And if I was talking to you live, I wouldn't have put that picture up there and I would ask the audience, why are bacon prices so high? Uh, usually they're starting uh, particularly by end of July and the summer months there. And, and the reason is very, very simple. That's when the garden tomato season comes on. Everybody has a lot of tomatoes and they want to have BLT sandwiches. And, uh, you know, in some cases, tomatoes are free. Uh, I've got some grandkids that are wanting to garden and learn how, and I think we put in 50 or 60 tomato plants this year. So if the weather comes through, we're gonna have a lot of tomatoes to give away too. But anyway, that's the reason why. Kind of interesting, again, just a history thing. You see last year that, that those, those the dotted circles there, the peak in belly prices was a little bit later almost a month later. And the reason why is some of you grow tomatoes and I know my tomato plants were late in producing last year and that was a US thing too. So uh, that kind of uh, happened as well. But anyway, uh, moving on then back to the blue line on that, oops, uh, yeah, stand that, the blue line on that chart. We talked about this earlier that that uh, bacon prices, uh, you, you know, that the, the uh, when, when the restaurants closed down, uh, bacon fell in price because consumers want to buy one pound packages and you know restaurants buy in 25 pound packages. So we had some adjustments there, but then as the shelves got bare and packing plants closed down, and so there's a lot less being uh, produced, then we did spike for a while, but came back down to about uh, you know, average prices now you might say, and, and um, you know, with restaurants are open back up and we channel some to the retail store and so on. Kind of interesting, again, from a his, uh, history lesson here. Uh, 20 years ago, the industry said that bellies are gonna be worth nothing. There's a so-called, uh, you know, fat, Nobody wanted to eat fat and a prediction bellies would be worthless and and uh, because of the health craze, but uh, actually, you know, as you can see, that didn't happen. Interestingly enough, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, bellies used to be a big trading item in the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. 20 years ago, CME quit trading bellies because they said nobody's going to want them. The price is going to go down to zero, so there's no use even trading them. But interestingly enough, you know, as we went to leaner pork and uh, chicken and so on, we started putting bacon on a lot of different things, chicken sandwiches, even put bacon on hamburgers and that increased the demand, even wrapped bacon around uh, tenderloin, beef tenderloins and so on. So we went from saying uh, bellies would be worth nothing to now they are the most expensive wholesale pork cut even above loin prices. Just look at that red line up there on the average bellies average a buck 20 a pound and pork loins average about 90 cents a pound. So oh, by and far bellies are the most expensive wholesale cut when we thought they would be worthless. You know, uh, our, our good friend Brian that just got through talking about if you've been watching his pictures, he's kind of fading away. He's lost over a hundred pounds eating mass quantities of bacon. So go to the next one. Uh, slide, please. Uh, uh, hot dogs is another interesting thing. This is again the week compared to last week change in in uh, in the amount of hot dogs being sold. And there, when the pandemic set in, like back in March again, we just spiked hot dog sales. Kind of came off, but they're still 17, 20 percent more than a year ago. And that's that 
you know, that uh, retail, that home trade as well. So go to the, my last slide, uh, kind of picking up again on tastes and preferences of consumers and uh, some of the same things I talked about on the hog side. This is one of my favorites to talk about on the chicken side. And again, kind of a little bit of a history lesson there. Uh, most of you know that, you know, uh, approximately my age and, and I'm gonna date myself here too, but in the 40s and 50s, when I grew up on the ranch, chicken was the most expensive uh, thing we uh, meet in the store. The, you know, the reason why is because that was before the Tysons of the world and commercial production of chicken. Chickens were free range, very expensive to grow. So chickens were very, very expensive. Uh, you know, in the in the store, more expensive than beef or or even lamb back then. Kind of interesting. We did have more lamb back then. So, you know, on the ranch we had a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep, even hogs, and so we had a lot of meat to eat. But my mom said, "By golly, even though chicken is expensive, we've got a chicken coop out here, and we've got cheap labor, and we've got grain." And so we're, you know, she liked a, a variety of things to eat. So she said, "By golly, we're going to have chicken." And by by the Fourth of July, we want to have some fried chicken. And so we'd always buy a couple hundred little chickens in the early in the spring and then buy here uh, next week the little biggest roosters would be big enough and and so we could have some some chicken even though it was expensive and that meant that you know somebody had to butcher them and so I had to butcher and pluck a lot of hundreds of chickens when I was young and you know this this is uh, the top slide is about chicken wings, but uh, you know, I didn't mind plucking those chickens, but that wing that that you got to pluck takes twice as long to pluck the pin feathers and stuff out of the wing, the whole chickens. And I must have been an economist back then because I told my dad, you know, let's just cut that end wing thing off and throw it away. It's all full of feathers. You don't eat it anyway. And he said, oh, no, no, mom's got to have that wing. And on the industry side as well, very difficult for the industry now, even now with the machines they have to get those last feathers off the wing. But anyway, that's a, that's a whole different uh, story there. So uh, talk a little bit about chicken wing prices here tend to you know be fairly stable the red line throughout the year but they spike two times in the year they spike when the football season starts there in the fall and then they also spike at super bowl time this year the blue line you know a lot of wings sold at the restaurant level and so you see when the restaurants closed the prices plummeted but then as the restaurants opened back up like we talked about before people had to get in and get their fix on wings again so we uh, we propped them uh, back up but again you know about 20 25 years ago uh, wings were the cheapest thing on on uh, cheapest cut cheapest wholesale cut on on chicken uh, restaurants and even retail levels could sell breasts and and the legs really well but nobody wanted wings so restaurants would just throw them in the stock pot make soup out of them and then all of a sudden some industrious restaurant decided to put some sauce on them and try to retail them and then you know the rest of the story the craze uh, took off there and uh, everybody's eating wings and now we've got restaurants just devoted to to uh, you know that's their main menu item and so something that was again worth nothing because of almost because of changing tastes and preferences of consumers now wings are the most expensive cut of chickens sell for more than breasts uh, last week uh, wings brought a dollar seventy one a pound on the wholesale market and breast bought a dollar twenty four and so uh, again uh, uh, that's one of the reasons now why we're seeing boneless wings because breasts are cheaper than wings and so we're making what once used to be the most expensive cut we're making wings out of breast I, I jokingly like to say people to people that the Tysons of the world hired expensive geneticists for work for many years to try to breed the wings off of chicken and now they're had to fire all those geneticists and hiring ones to get more wings on chicken so uh with now that we've had our our uh, bacon and wings for lunch let's get over and see what's happening in the energy sector
Good, thanks, Tim. Uh, Dave Ripplinger, Bioproducts, Bioenergy Economic Specialist. Uh, just again, some a few comments about what's going on uh, in the ethanol industry. Uh, kind of first and foremost, uh, just comparing uh, where we are this year versus last year, and then also just looking at the dip that we're continuing to come off of. Uh, basically, uh, this last week, uh, or the week that ended uh, last Friday, uh, we again saw about a 5% uh, increase in ethanol production, uh, which is approximately equivalent to the, in a little bit bigger than the size of North Dakota's corn ethanol industry. So, uh, you know, a few hundred million, uh, 500, 600 million uh, gallons came back online were produced last year, last week, um, which is, again, good news and the trajectory is the right way. Uh, it's important to note too, it's summertime and that, that fuel use, transportation fuel use for passenger travel is, is seasonally higher uh, this time of year. Uh, but again, that's one reason why you might wanna look uh, at this time of year versus last year. And right now we're running at about 83, 84% of where we were a year ago. Um, and, and again, about this time of year ago, we were at 100% capacity utilization or close to it. Um, and again, we, we kind of see that continued growth uh, Frain had asked me a question earlier today, you know, where are we with that number today? And it's actually somewhat tough to tell because we do know that a number of corn ethanol refineries have uh, uh, permanently shuttered, that they won't be back. And that's probably at least a billion gallons worth of capacity. Uh, but we don't know exactly where that number is. And, and some of the folks who are still closed will likely uh, remain closed uh, permanently whenever they decide to make that call. And of course, uh, you know, staying closed for, for some amount of time doesn't necessarily help the financials and, and push things a little bit. But again, uh, you know, the, the trend is certainly in the right direction uh, off, off those lows in mid-April. Uh, looking at uh, margins, uh, things are not as good as they were a week ago. Uh, looking at some of the numbers from USDA uh, for today. Uh, but in general, they're 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 better than needed to, to keep folks rolling. Again, my 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 number is about a buck twenty five, and we're at a dollar thirty six uh, crush for for a for a, for a bushel. A dollar fifty is really nice where it was a week ago. Uh, in South Dakota, the, the refineries are paying a bit less for corn, um, getting a li little bit less for ethanol, and also a little bit less for distillers. So things aren't moving in the right direction. But again, it's it's as that capacity comes back online as production increases, you'd expect those margins. Uh, to decline a little bit, but again, you know, we're still seeing that 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 movement. And another way to look at this too is just look at days of storage. So again, uh, the amount that's available in stocks versus that 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 use that daily use. And actually, this last week, uh, ending ending last Friday, we had the lowest days in storage that we've had all year, um, and definitely in that range in the mid twenties. Uh, where we'd like to be. Again, the trajectory is, is still moving uh, down. Uh, and again, we, we, we passed that threshold. We're just above 25 days in storage, uh, which again is, is a pretty uh, supportive number. Uh, last thing I have is just to look at the blend rate. So this is uh, ethanol input into a, a refinery or blender versus all the gasoline that comes out. You know, if it was all E10, you know, we'd see that 10% rate. Obviously, we have some uh, e zero is still available in the marketplace, and a little in some sales of E fifteen and E eighty five. The numbers aren't perfect because it's not actually gasoline going into the refinery. Uh, you know that's going to be uh, you know produced in, in, in some respects. You know you know at the at the refinery from crude, so we don't have that number. But it's really kind of interesting just to see the changes. And so we saw that that relatively large dip uh, as COVID hit, and I think a lot of that was just using up some of the ethanol that was already there that was already at the at, at the blender or at the refiner and now we're back to that same rate and so that that's good and in, in general what that means is we want to see uh increased gasoline consumption or continually increasing gasoline use uh with ethanol moving right along with it and again in general i think that that's for the most part where we're going with this summertime and, and for me it's you know we continue seeing that increasing clip for the next month or two and then of course once driving season ends you know what's going to happen and of course you know Brian alluded to you know if we see uh, the second wave or this continued growth of the of the virus or you know uh, increased rates in certain parts of the country for example Texas you know what is that going to mean for travel and of course we don't know that for sure but in general the you know the trends are definitely going the right way uh, 
final update. That's all I had in terms of the, the biofuels market. I uh, just to let you know, we are gonna continue uh, with this webinar series throughout the summer, uh, but we're gonna actually move the date and how often we have it. So beginning on July 9th, uh, which is a Thursday, uh, we'll, begin, we'll continue having the webinar series, but it'll be every other Thursday uh, through Labor Day uh, as scheduled. We'll be sending out some additional information so everyone who's uh, on our listserv uh, for this will be getting that information we'll, and we'll promote it a, a few different ways uh, to make sure that everyone catches it. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll move over and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Again, you can, we prefer, you, our preference is to use the Q&A tool, but you're also welcome to use the chat tool uh, if you're more comfortable with that. And I'll give you guys just a, a few minutes if you wanna get to that. Again, you can check out any a recording uh, of this uh, at, the, at those sites below or uh, check out some of these presentations if you wanna see further. Uh, we do have quite a few folks who do catch this later on. Uh, and again, you know, you're obviously on now, but folks who might catch it next week, uh, you know, are also uh, on on the docket too. So with that, I guess we'll we'll wait a few more seconds and see if any questions come in. Uh, the one thing I would say is that uh, beef brisket is 233 at at Sam's Club. So if anybody wants to buy a whole brisket, that's that's not a bad price. I, I already have one in the fridge. One thing I wanted to add was. <clears throat> You know, with this trending increased rate, you know, there's a lot of talk right now in Washington from just about everyone, whether it's the House, Senate, and uh, the President, the Executive, on if there's going to be another round of stimulus or a CARES Act-like uh, program coming down the pike in the next uh, couple of months. Um, and one of the things everyone's watching then in ag is is there going to be additional funding on top of what was already allocated under the cares act and i i tend to believe there's a there's a big appetite obviously with everybody basically saying there needs to be another stimulus in, including the uh, uh jerome powell the fed chairman is saying that uh and all branches of our government are saying it so I would actually be surprised at this point if there isn't another round, especially given the trend in the increased infection rate and how, what that's going to mean going forward. So again, we, we don't have any answers on this, but right now, in my opinion, uh, there is going to be probably another. Now, what it's going to look like can vary. If anybody's looked, they've got one uh, bill that's an infrastructure type, another one that talks about direct payments, another one that talks about relief in the form of a ta long tax holiday where, where basically federal income taxes aren't collected and on down the line. And I would be surprised if there's not, if there is another round that there's not a portion carved out for ag uh, as well after everything from the initial uh, program has been paid out. So that's something to keep in mind and keep, uh, uh, keep, keep your eye out for that, that, that we made we may not be done this year actually um, coming up with uh, additional funding for farmers. Thanks, Brian. And I'm not seeing uh, any other questions coming up. I don't know, Frayn or Tim, if you have any other comments you wanna make? No, I don't, I don't have any additional comments, just if there were some questions. I think I'm good. I don't know, uh, Brian, but you know, on that farm payment thing, I think doesn't some money get automatically put into the CCC here soon that could be used to that was appropriate, but it didn't go in until July or summer frame. Well, it was the end of June. It was after the end of June. Um, so I guess in the next few days uh, that that turns over and then there's some more funding available. Like as they said with the, with the uh, original program, they were gonna pay out 80% of what you calculated to be entitled to, to ensure that there was enough money up front to give everybody some money. And then whatever's remaining, uh, if there's enough, you'll get the remaining 20% that you were in, uh, that the calculator figured you were entitled to. So that's kind of one of the things that they were waiting on. But again, the sign up period for this goes went all the way into August. So I, I don't know that they would have a program, another program on top of this one at the same time that the sign up period was still available. Yeah, right. Um, so the timing of that may be a little bit screwy because they have to wait until they see how much is because they're not going to know how much they have to pay that, that needs to be paid out until the sign up period expire, expires right but there would be some money there even without further appropriations if 
if it doesn't get expend, if it doesn't get called for in that new money that goes into CCC. Yeah, but I don't think it would be part of the program. That would be part of the traditional role of CCC, yeah. um, of being able to provide commodity loans and those other things. There still needs to be funding available for that. They can't just liquidate the triple C for for the CARES Act program. There has to be enough money sitting in the kitty to do commodity loans and what they typically do with the CCC. So that's what part of that money is also for. Sure. Great, thanks guys. Uh, since there are no more questions, I want to thank the panelists again. I uh, wish everyone who's uh, still on a, a happy 4th of July, and hopefully we can see you on Thursday, July 9th, as we continue the webinar series. Thanks.